Hey guys. <clears throat> All right, let's begin. So uh, last uh, last class we talked about uh, we, we we did chapter four, and we talked about um, how to deal with forces and how to relate it. Oh, I'm like, am I actually taller? Can you uh, mute yourself, please? Is there a speaker? Yes. And how uh, these forces relate to uh, objects moving, right? And, and basically, uh, we did a force diagram where we drew all the forces, and we used Newton's second law, which said that, um, uh, the sum of all the forces on the object uh, tells you which direction the acceleration will be in, right? It's uh, F forces equal to uh, mass times acceleration. So all we have to do is add up the components of all the forces involved in a, uh, um, applied on an object and we, would, we, we can know uh, uh, how it moves in the world, which is very powerful. Even if it's not moving, we could tell a lot about it by how the forces forces cancel out. So even though you don't see any, uh, even though there may, may not be movement, it, it's still very important. And uh, this is important for buildings and roads and, um, and objects that are static. So a building, even though uh, none of the material is moving, which we want, um, there's still a lot of forces on on each I beam or whatnot. And they all have to cancel out. So, um, uh, and that's called the static equilibrium. And uh, force diagrams are very important for that. But uh, let's continue on our discussion from last week. And. And uh, now, and look at these forces through the moving objects, let's say a box on an inclined plane, right? But instead, let's uh, add uh, um, friction to the picture. And uh, friction is uh, an interesting force, right? So it, it's interesting in that it could change, hold on, let me get my. It's interesting in the fact that the force applied by friction can change based on the other forces, and which, which is uh, different than the acceleration due to gravity. Acceleration due to gravity or the force due to gravity is the same no matter no matter what other forces are applied, but with friction, that's not that's not the case. And let's see. So So first, let's go over what friction is, and what is it, what is it caused by? So when two objects come into contact, there seems to always be um, some kind of attractive force between uh, the surfaces of the objects. I, I shouldn't say um, always attractive, but a force that always resists uh, the two surfaces sliding against it. Um, generally, this comes out as an attractive van der Waals forces. You're familiar with that in chemistry. Um, but um, 
what ends up happening on a microscopic level is that these two surfaces are rough. And when you slide one against the other, they will come into contact and actually some of the atoms will be ripped off of one and uh, they, they would exchange material. And what happens is when it's still and it's not moving like this, um, uh, the, the atomic interfaces or the atoms at the surface, you can look at atoms as little balls, right? They, uh, the atoms between the, the two surfaces, make it larger. Let's say this is, this is from the top surface. There are attractive van der Waals forces between them. And what ends up happening is that some of the atoms make bonds with each other. Make bonds with each other and they kind of, uh, what's known as they center together or, or um, or you could say they partially weld together. Now, it's generally uh, not very strong. You know, we could easily separate it and uh, we don't really feel the force when we lift up a box from, from the other surface. But if we push it, what happens is that some of the atoms break apart, break away from one surface to the other and stay attached. And uh, this force to break, uh, the bonds holding the atoms in, in the object requires some force, and this is where it uh, comes from, right? Now, the way we, we describe this force, uh, so the force through the friction depends on really two quantities, all right? depends on the normal force right? and a coefficient in front of the normal force, right? Uh, I'll just put a subscript script K over here. So the normal force tells us how hard something uh, tells us the force that one object, or the, the, let's say uh, the table, one object pushes on the other, right? So when I push my hand on here, you know, there's some force that I'm pushing on the board, right? And that's the normal force, right? Now, this is different from gravity, obviously, because if we're on an inclined plane, the normal force will become different, right? Depending on, uh, uh, on the, on the angle of the incline. Now, this intuitively makes sense, right? The harder you push down, you push this object down on the table, um, the more bonds that these uh, atoms can um, create, and the more likely, more likely that um, these uh, microscopic ridges will kind of come into contact with each other and, and uh, reduce the motion, right? And it's related to it by a coefficient, right? Uh, a friction, it's just a number that, that's empirically measured really, basically. It's, it's a very complicated uh, um, forces, the, the forces that connect the two objects together are very complicated and we just end up measuring it empirically um, uh, using this equation. So, and this depends on the material properties, how easy, how attractive are the atoms to other atoms, how smooth, how smooth is the atomic ladder, lattice at the surface. It, the coefficient of friction depends on a lot of things. So it's just some coefficient times the normal force. That's all it is. Now it has interesting properties, right? Um, one interesting property is that this force changes depending on the other force. So let's say if we have, so let's say if we have our mystery box from before, right, that, that we used last time, and 
let's say I apply a force to it. Well, we'll apply different forces, All right? Let's say if I apply force, we'll call that force A. Force A, and then this is Fn. That. Fn, right? And then we have the force due to gravity, mg. And then we have the force due to friction. This always opposes the motion or uh, whatever uh, motion. So uh, uh, if without gravity, we would have a force in this direction that would tell us uh, how it moves, right? And of course in the Y, it doesn't move. But now that we have a force of friction, there's another force going this way. So when we draw the free body diagram of this guy, right, we have Fn, Mg, Fa, and F force friction. This is an Fn. Right. So let me ask you. Let's say if I get rid of this force Fa. What is the force of friction then? Let's write down the equations in motion first. So in the y direction, in the y direction is equal to Fn minus Fg, and this is equal to zero, right? Or I should say the acceleration in the y direction, we know that is zero. So this implies that Fn minus Fg is equal to zero. And if we write it all out, we find that the normal force is equal to mg. Right? Now in the x direction, we have this. force supply minus the force of friction, right? Now, if I don't apply any force here, let's say Fa is zero, right? What is the force of friction equal to? Is it zero? Yes, that's correct. So it's zero, right? Because there's no force pushing it this way. This is not moving, so there, there's no uh, there's no acceleration um, in the, in the horizontal direction. So that means there's no force of friction, right? The force of friction only comes about when there's another force applied to it, right? And, and so friction. I'm oh, sorry. I I just have a question. Is friction like a from the third law then of, of, of Newton? Like it's a reactionary force kind of? Um, no, it, it, it's, it's not exactly a reactionary force. Um, because you gotta realize the reactionary force, there needs to be two objects, right? So on, on this like Fa is, let's say my hand pushing the block, right? The reactionary force, would be the force uh, um, that I feel on my hand that, that would be uh, uh, that I would feel it going in the opposite direction. That's what would be the re uh, reactionary force. So the reactionary force really takes two objects uh, uh, to be there, right? You need to separate two objects, right? 
I care, you have one object, my hand, one object, uh, this mystery box, right? When I push it this way, I apply a force FA that direction, the box applies a force in that direction, right? That's not the same thing as this. Of course, there's, there's an equal opposite uh, force on the, on the table that you feel from the force of friction, but that, that would be the reactionary force for the force of friction. So it's not a reactionary force, um, right? But it is, um, it's what is known as a dissipative force, right? It, it takes the energy out of the system. Well, we'll get into that, but it, um, what it does is that you apply a certain energy. Don't worry about the definition of energy right now. You push it this way, and it kind of takes the energy out of the system. So it, it's just um, it's a dissipative force, really. Um, so if I don't push on it, there's no force of friction, right? If I push on it just a, a tad, right? Let's say if I push on it ten newtons. So so if F A. So let's say for the first case. Fa is equal to zero, right? That this implies that the force of friction is also zero, right? Now, what this means is that we're not using the force of friction right now, right? When we actually calculate the force force of friction, this we're using this equation. We're calculating the maximum force of friction that we can have in the system, right? Now, depending on whether the object is moving or still, we'll have a different coefficient of friction. If it's moving, we call that kinetic, uh, the kinetic uh, coefficient of friction. If it's still, it's called the static coefficient of friction, right? And if it's still these, uh, if it's not moving, the static tends to be uh, larger than the, the than the kinetic. And this be, this is uh, um, uh, usually attributed to the fact that if it's static, it, it allows uh, more of these bonds, these intersurface bonds, to be created between you know uh, the two objects. So this increases the static coefficient of friction. But, so in our case, we're actually using the static coefficient of friction, right? And, 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 uh, and here, it would be equal to 0.4, um, this 0.4, it's just the coefficient, there's no units on it, it's unitless, right? So this means now. Now we said that if we don't push on it, there's no co there's no friction. But I define friction over here as this, right? And we could easily calculate this. This is 0.4 times the mass times g. And in our problem, remember what the mass was? It was 10 kilograms. Right, and when we do the calculations, we find that this is equal to thirty nine newtons. So the force of friction, based on our calculations, can be up to thirty nine newtons. Right. So what does this mean? This means that I can apply a force FA up to 39 newtons before this object starts to move, right? So that means if I apply 10 newtons, right, the object is not going to move. So let's say if I apply 10 newtons. <clears throat> 
we still have to satisfy this equation. If we're applying a force of 10 newtons and the, the coefficient, the friction resists the motion and it could go up to 39 newtons, that means that we're not moving. The object is not moving. So that means that there's no acceleration. So by our forces in the x direction, we know that this is equal to zero and we have this condition where Fa is equal to F, right? And this will hold up until, uh, up until the uh, force of friction is less than the force that's applied. Right. Then, right, so if we have this, that means that the force of friction is 10, right? And this follows this rule up until we, um, we surpass this quantity, right? So the static uh, friction kind of uh, uh, supplies just enough force to stop the motion, right? Uh, so, so that it, nothing moves. And then once you get past the, the max amount, then the object will start to move. Once the object starts to move, we'll enter the kinetic, we'll start using the kinetic uh, coefficient of friction. So once it starts to move, let's say if we apply 40 newtons, so if we apply 40 newtons, right, that means is Right. That means it's more than uh, the 39 newtons, and we enter a different regime. We have to now. We have now that it's moving. We have to. We have to use um, uh, the kinetic uh, coefficient of friction. Right. And here, the kinetic is given by is is less than the static, like usual, and it's 0.3. Right. So if we write it like this, we'll have this minus mu f times f n. And then when we calculate it, we find that this is 29 newtons, 98 times 0.3. And we find that the net force is 11 newtons in the positive direction, right? So that means the acceleration is, is 1.1 newtons, right? Oh, I'm sorry, net newtons. Meters per second squared. All right. So depending on how the force is applied, the uh, friction can uh, change, All right? It resists uh, the motion. Now you have to realize that this, uh, the equation for friction is not a fundamental law, right? It's just, it's an experimental law where we have to calculate this mu and it's general, the force of friction is generally given by this. 
uh, for us to fundamentally calculate calculate the friction, we would have to know all the forces involved uh, between the top and the bottom, uh, between the, uh, the two surfaces. But we don't, so we just uh, use it in this situation. So depending on how, how uh, the force is applied, uh, you have to consider the direction of friction. Like, let's say if we applied Fa in, in the opposite direction, the force of friction would now reverse itself, right? It, it would be in the, what we call the positive direction. What we normally label as the positive direction. Right? Um, and if we look at a graph of the friction, where we have um, uh, the friction on one side and then the force applied on the other side, we see that what ends up happening is that we increase in the static regime while the object is not moving, the, the force of friction increases um, literally one to one with force applied, right? Because they cancel each other out. Then once we get up to its max value, we'll see a drop off and then the kinetic friction will stay roughly the same amount, right? No matter how fast you move, no, no matter uh, the force that you apply or the speed that it moves at the uh, uh, kinetic coefficient of friction is roughly the same. This is why when you push an object, it's hard to get the object to start moving once you have it moving, it's easy to continue the motion. This has to actually do with this uh, coefficient of friction. Then there's actually a third uh, form, and this has to do with rolling objects. So think of a ball uh, of a bicycle wheel rolling, right? Now, at, uh, for it to roll. Right. Technically, it's not uh, uh, it's not sliding against the ground. It's rolling so that each part of the wheel touches a different section. Right. If you, if you look at that, right. So it's not slipping. It's not sliding against the ground, but it's also not static. This is called the rolling coefficient of friction. And it's actually somewhere in between static and kinetic, right? which uh, I think it makes intuitive sense if you think about it. Okay. Now, what else can you do with this? Right. Um, so you could use the coefficient of friction to. Uh, adhere stuff to the walls, right? If you, if you have enough force applied to the chalkboard, I can hold it up without it falling down, right? Even though the gravity, uh, gravity is this way, I'm pushing and I'm pushing on it perpendicular to gravity. They shouldn't interact with each other, but because of friction, uh, um, the force of friction will, will uh, compensate for any force due to gravity going down, okay? Now, let's do another problem. So let's do three by three. 
Now here, it's like the last problem where we had our mystery box. But instead of applying uh, a force just in, in one dimension in the, in the horizontal dimension, we apply it at an angle to, the, to this axis. Right. Now, let's we'll do the force diagram. Uh, let's draw all the different forces. Okay, we have our normal force. We have our force due to gravity. And we have our frictional force. We'll draw it in that direction because it's opposing uh, force. We'll call this F of T. Right. Now, how is this different from the last problem? What's the major difference in this problem? And of course, it has to be related to uh, the angle, right? But why is what what makes it so different from the last problem? Anybody? On the angle with the force? Well, yes, the angle, but what does that imply? I guess a lesser force of friction. Yes, exactly. So now, because the, um, now because uh, we have part of the force that we apply in this vertical direction, this is going to affect F of N, and this is going to eventually affect the force of friction, right? So now we have the supplied force affecting the force of friction, right? So we can reduce the force of friction by applying a uh, uh, force at an angle, right? And this is an optimization problem. So let's write down all the forces. So in the y direction, what are the forces? So this is equal to MA in, in the y direction. Of course, in this problem, it should be zero, but let's not assume that just yet. And then we have the same mass as before. M is equal to 10 kilograms. All right. So in the y direction, we have mg, right, minus, or I'm sorry, I should write uh, fn plus fp, and then let's calculate uh, the component. Do we want it? So if we're calculating the y component, FPY, what do we want to use? Sine 30. Yep. Sine 30. That's the opposite of the angle. All right. And then this is minus mg. Right. And we know that this is zero, right? Because it's not moving in the vertical direction. Or we have, to, we have to make sure that it's not moving in a vertical direction. How can we tell if it's not moving in a vertical direction? If FP is uh, smaller than MG, right? And in this, in this problem, FP, FP is equal to, Uh, 40 newtons. Right? And we know that mg, mg if this is 10 kilograms times 9.8, we know it's 98 newtons. So we know that it's not larger than it. So uh, we, we therefore know that this is zero. Right? 
zero volts. Okay, so then now let's finish it. We will want to calculate the normal force so that we could uh, get uh, the force of friction. And this is just equal to mg minus s2. All right, and this is what we'll use. Now let's figure out in the y direction, in the x direction. So what are the forces in the, in the x direction? We have this one. And we have the force of friction. So this is. Which is the force of friction. Hold on, guys. I'll be right back. Sorry, guys. The vertical force does equal uh, zero in this case, or uh, the net forces, I do, right, we should say. This is equal to zero, and then we find the normal force, right? The normal force is what really cancels out these other two, right? So it keeps it from moving in the vertical. Now, um, now we have this. Let's rewrite it. F, we'll plug in our formula for this. It's moving. So I'm just going to include uh, the kinetic uh, force of friction times Fn, right? And then Fn, in this case, is this. And this is our answer this way. So let's say if we want to find acceleration, right? So then we know that mx is equal to this. And let's pull out fp. All right, kind of put it put in this in terms of FP, and then uh, minus 